Well, happy Sunday to you. It's good to see you. Um, a uh, extra special happy daylight savings time uh, to you. Hope you enjoyed your bonus uh, hour of sleep for uh, those of you who are parents of young children. My condolences to you. Um, those changes are tough for kids, so I'm sure you've been up uh, much of the morning, but we are glad that you are here today uh, as we continue in uh, our Vision and Values series here at King's Cross. Before we do that, though, just a, a few minutes of uh, some really Real quick business. If you, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm finding a little bit of a cold. Um but if you uh, are signed up for and receive uh, many of our church emails and newsletters, uh, the midweek update that you receive from me uh, on Wednesdays, you would have seen a brief note in there about uh, just some uh, church business that comes with this time of the year, uh, including kind of a special section about our church budget. Two weeks from today, in a business meeting after uh, worship, we will consider... Uh, voting on and adopting our 2020 budget. And uh, if you didn't get a copy of that email or that information, um, a few hard copies, a handful, uh, are available in the church office over here after the service. You can just get a, a printed copy of what we had to say about that as well as just the um, categorical breakdowns of the budget. But here's just a few words I wanted to share with you about that. Um, and about why budgets matter in the broad scheme of our work and life together as a church. Um, the first thing I want to share with you uh, is just some nuts and bolts about it. So um, our finance team has been diligently working for months now with our staff and ministry teams going through our normal process where they've received requests, worked together uh, intentionally, prayerfully through discerning that, and um, have formulated a budget. Um, which they've unanimously agreed upon and are bringing before us to consider as a church. And that budget uh, includes an increase of about $41,000 for the year, which is about a 7 to 8% increase for us as a church, um, which to me is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Because what happens for us when we consider a budget, the way we're structured as a church, a lot of the fine details of the finances we invest the staff with, our finance team with, our leadership as a church with that. And yet we still intentionally decide to consider the fullness of the budget together as a church. Because you see, as a church, when we begin to formulate a budget, it is really an exercise in faithfulness for us. Just as we sang a moment ago about God's faithfulness to us, it is in turn our joy and our responsibility to strive together, to be faithful to who God is calling us, <clears throat> calling us to be. And a budget, the financial manifestation of who we are, is an exercise in being faithful to who God is calling us to be. And so for us, if we believe that we are called to embrace brokenness and champion wholeness, that if we are called to do that because we believe whole people can change the whole world, then when we formulate a budget together, we're dreaming of what a year's worth of life and ministry can look like. And when we adopt that budget, when we say yes together to a budget, we are choosing together to share that responsibility. And so when you give to King's Cross, when you give to your church, you are giving to the work of wholeness in our community, in our state, across our country, and around the world. That's pretty awesome. Giving for us, I believe, uh, and we'll talk more about this in the coming weeks and in the first part of next year, but really, giving for us should be an exercise, not that's burdensome, not that's full of guilt, but that is full of joy. That just as Christ came to us, just as he endured shame on the cross for us, he gave us the gift of life freely, right? That Christ goes to the cross, not saying to his, to his disciples, okay, guys, I'll go do this if. 
I'll endure this if, if you promise to be good, to act right and to talk right. I'll go through with this if you promise to go to church every Sunday. If you stop doing this or start doing this, no, the gift of grace is grace. It's a gift given freely. And so we, in turn, choose to give of ourselves, of our time, our talent, our passion, our finances, freely. That just as 1 John tells us, we love because He first loves us. We get to give because He first gave to us. And so over the next few weeks, we would just ask you to pray about that. That that 7 to 8% increase is an increase in what we have to share together. It means, it means an increase to what we're already giving. That means an increase in the number of people giving for us. But even more importantly, it means an increase in our potential impact in our community the kingdom's impact in the world. And I don't know about you, but I get really excited dreaming those dreams with you. So uh, the budget's here, the numbers are shared. Uh, you're more than welcome to pick up a hard copy, but you'll see those from me again. Uh, this week and in the, over the next couple weeks before we vote on it, it's an increase, as I said before, from our current operating budget this year of just under $546,000, $546,000, yeah, um, to an increase of about uh, 587000 about a $41,000 uh, increase um, year over year. We think that's right. We think that's uh a good next step for us, and we couldn't be more excited. We want to share that excitement with you in that process. So we'll consider that in two weeks. The finance team will be available uh, next week uh, after Bible study in the conference room, which is down the concourse out these doors. They'd love if you've got questions to answer those questions for you. Of course, I am always available for those questions as well. Um, now, uh, with that behind us, let's turn uh, together to uh, our continuing conversation around core values for us. Speaking of our shared common future, this calling that God has placed upon our church, we've been going, we're in the midst now of a 12-week series, really nearing the end of it. Um, if you can believe it, Advent will be here in just a handful of weeks, and we'll turn our eyes towards the Christ child, Christ coming, His birth in to the world. Uh, but we have a few more core values to go, about four more weeks together, and so today we are on our third of five core values. If you want to start uh, flipping or swiping your way to our scripture passage this morning, we'll be in Matthew 16. And as we're doing that, let me just kind of recap for you, if you've missed a few weeks for us, where we've been. We've looked uh, early on in our series about, okay, what is God calling us to do? Who is God calling us to be as a church? We recognize that the church, the big church, uh, the universal church, is one of God's fundamental plans for bringing the kingdom into the world. That just as Christ both is the good news and bears the good news into the world, we recognize that God has designed the church to be, what, the hands and feet of Christ. To be a continuation of the good news entering into and transforming the world. That's the church universal. That's all churches everywhere across all places and all times among all peoples. Well, so then we, we step back and say, well, what is our part in this? What's our our responsibility, who has God uniquely made us, King's Cross, to be as a body of believers? And that we believe, as we've gone through this process, that we believe we are uniquely called, that our unique purpose, that our mission is to be a people that embrace brokenness and champion wholeness in and through Jesus Christ. That it's not simply uh, something that we, brokenness, that we choose to tolerate, that we choose to welcome, that we address in the quiet, in the background, but no, we want to choose to embrace brokenness, that we run towards it in ourselves and one another. But that brokenness isn't the end of the story, right? That Jesus doesn't leave us broken, but rather meets us in that brokenness and brings about the hope of wholeness that comes through Christ. And so that we believe, though, that this is meaningful work. It's not just busy work. It's not just good things to do while we're here on earth. 
that we believe the more whole we become, the more the world changes for the better. We believe whole people can change the whole world. That as we become more whole, our families change, our cities change, the trajectory of generations can change. So this is good and worthwhile work. We've then talked about how we believe fundamentally that the goodness, the good news of the gospel is that Jesus Christ has come into the world and wants to have a relationship with you. That Christ, the Savior of the cosmos, is not this distant figure that came to do this thing begrudgingly for us or among us, but that Christ has come into the world and wants to know you wants to know you and me and enter into the fullness of our life, the best of who we are and the worst, even our brokenness. And from there, that the reality comes to us that if, if God is coming into the world in order to have a relationship with you, then we should want to have a relationship with you too. Makes sense, doesn't it? That most of what God longs to do, much of what God longs to do in the world, that his transformation, his new creation, as Paul calls it in 2 Corinthians 5, happens in and through relationship. And so while we uh, are continuing to develop a strategic plan that we'll talk more about in the coming weeks and months, that we believe at the core of any strategy to embrace brokenness and champion wholeness will be a common commitment to intimate, transformative relationships that we know we'll be being faithful to God's calling on us when we're continuing to push one another into transformative relationships. And so then we entered into where we are now, the last section of this vision series, which is our core values. I described it once uh, uh, to someone this way, that one of the things I love about our church, I don't know if you all realize this or not, sometimes um, we don't realize things about our family until someone from outside the family comes in, right? You have a baby, uh, maybe you have a marriage, um, that the family is enlarged, and whenever that happens, I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but whenever someone joins a family, all it seems to do is magnify what's already there, right? Ask any parent of a newborn, and they'll tell you, the best of them and the worst of them is magnified when that little life comes in. Same thing with the marriage, but that when someone joins a family, it magnifies who we are. And so one of the joys of being a new pastor, and any pastor will tell you this, is you get to join a family. And then you get to see up close um, who they are and what makes them special. Well, one of the things that makes this place, this group of people, special is that we are what I would maybe call a big tent church. I don't know if you realize this or not, but we're a pretty diverse group of people in terms of our faith journeys. We've got all kinds of people, people that have been in church uh, their whole lives, people that have never been in church. We have people of different generations, different backgrounds, different occupations, people of different denominational experiences, different theologies. We are an incredibly diverse gathering and group of Christians. But the way that that works in order to be a big tent is that the bigger your tent becomes, the bigger your center pole has to be in order to hold it up. And so we believe for us at King's Cross this common vision, this common mission that regardless our background, regardless our time in this church or any church, that our common mission of embracing brokenness and championing wholeness, that is the common mission that keeps the tent up. That's what we gather around. But then uh, there's a lot of movement, there's a lot of space inside a big tent for a diversity of experiences, and that's a worthy and good thing as well. But part of that process, too, is also defining values, right? Beginning to define some boundaries. Not to say this is good or bad, but to say this is where we can invest and where we're limited and maybe we can't invest. These are the things that we value and these are the things that we currently don't value or maybe someday we'll value. Value. But rather, here's a collection, here's some boundary markers for us that we believe our common future of embracing brokenness and championing wholeness encourages us, requires us to pursue diligently and wisely together. 
And so the first two core values, one was a recommitment to the next generation, Psalm 78, that we embraced uh, part of the Israelite history, the responsibility of passing our faith on to the next generation. The second uh, was found, we talked last week in Hebrews 10, Hebrews 12, and John 14, this recognition, this pursuit of Christ's pioneering power to innovate, to embrace creativity, to take the gospel to new places out before us, or to make pathways back to those who've been left behind. So, that's where we've been now, this is where we are today. Our third core value this morning is the core value of simplicity. The core value of simplicity. Um, before we go on, let me pause there and we'll, we'll turn uh, and look at our scripture this morning where we see this value playing out. And then we'll talk about how exactly does this get lived out in a church today? How do we choose to value and pursue simplicity together as a church? As you're doing that, though, um, let me read for us Matthew 16. I'll read for us verses 16 through 26. Excuse me, 19, Matthew 19, 16 through 26. This is what it says. Someone came to Jesus with this question. Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? Why ask me about what is good? Jesus replied. There is only one who is good. But to answer your question, if you want to receive eternal life, keep the commandments. Which one? The man asked. And Jesus replied, you must not murder, you must not commit adultery, you must not steal, you must not testify falsely. Honor your father and mother. Love your neighbor as yourself. I've obeyed all these commandments, the young man replied. What else must I do? Jesus told him, if you want to be perfect, go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. But when the young man heard this, he went away sad, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you the truth, it is very hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. I'll say it again, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich, rich person to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were astounded. Then who in the world can be saved? They asked. Jesus looked at them intently and said, humanly speaking, it is impossible. But with God, everything is possible. Now, this is a, a common story, just a little bit of context about where we find ourselves this morning. And there's a few things I, I want to mention for us, as well as challenge and change a little bit of the conversation. So this particular story, or a form or version of it, appears in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We often refer to this story as Jesus' encounter with the rich young ruler. But that's really an amalgamation, a combination of all three stories. In Mark, the focus is on the youth. He's referred to as a young man. Here in Matthew, he's a rich young man. And in Luke, he's a ruler. And so what that begins to tell us is that each of these gospel writers, as we've talked about before when it comes to telling a story, when you tell a story, we tend to kind of hold it up to the light, like a kaleidoscope of sorts. And as we twist it and turn it, new colors begin to refract out of it, right? And so in Matthew's story, the emphasis on both the youth and the wealth of the individual is important here. But I want to suggest, I would argue this morning, that one of the core principles of this story, of this interaction, is at the end of the day, it is not fundamentally about wealth. It is and it isn't. I'll tell you what I mean by that. The first thing, though, um, is let me just offer a brief disclaimer. 
when it comes to talking about the rich. Rich is inherently relative, right? And for us, rich tends to be what? Someone who just has a little bit more than we do, right? That's often when we think of rich how we define it. But just for context, if we want to talk about rich this morning, um, there's a, an interesting website run by a nonprofit. You can check it out later. It's called the Global Rich List. And you can put in your income, and it will compare your income on a global scale to see where you fit. So I picked just a couple numbers this morning to help us get a global perspective on wealth. If you uh, were to make an income of $30,000 a year today, in 2019, you would be earning an income in the top 1.27% in the world. If you earned an income of $40,000 a year, you would jump to the top 0.57% in the world. The top 0.57% in the world. It provides a lot more data there, can help you get a global perspective on what other people, other places are uh, providing. For instance, if you're making $40,000 a year, I think I saw on there that that's uh, roughly enough money to pay the monthly salary of over 100 doctors in Pakistan. Just off of that. So again, rich is a relative perspective, right? But this morning, again, I don't think at the heart of the story, at the heart of Jesus' concern, is uh, fundamentally a, uh, a concern with just the goodness or the badness of wealth. I don't think that's what Jesus is interested in talking about. In part because we see later on, for instance, in Matthew 27, where uh, Joseph of Arimathea is talked about as a wealthy man, he can afford to buy extra tombs there. He's talked about, and his wealth is talked about in nothing but positive terms. So if you've got that in the back of your mind, right, if you're getting stuck on this wealthy, on this rich conversation, let me just encourage you to try and let that go and move on to, I think, the deeper conversation that Matthew's gospel is inviting us to consider this morning. So look back there with me real briefly, and there's a few elements we need to pull out, I think, to get to the heart of what's going on here. He says, teacher, what good must I do to have eternal life? It seems like a pretty important question, one that I don't know about you, but I'm pretty interested in the answer, right? There's a part of us that, particularly as Christians in America today, eternal life is a deep, important, connectional conversation for us. And yet, in Matthew's Gospel, this is one of only three times that eternal life is mentioned. One of only three times in 28 chapters. Two of the times happen here in chapter 19, and then once more in chapter 25. So this tells us that this is a specific and unique conversation. Something is happening here that happens almost nowhere else in Matthew's gospel. We're venturing into uncharted territory in the gospel. Jesus then begins to interact with the man. He says, why ask me about what is good? And they begin to have this conversation around eternal life, about keeping the commandments. Remember, Matthew's gospel, most likely written to a Jewish Christian audience. So the commandments, this is something that Matthew elevates in the Jesus experience and narrative here. He says, well, you need to keep the commandments. They put you towards this path of eternal, of fullness, of, as John's gospel would say, a abundant life together. He says, well, he begins to go through the greatest hits of the Ten Commandments, right? Well, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't testify falsely, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. He throws that one in for good measure, right? He says, I've obeyed all these commandments. What else must I do? Verse 21. Jesus told him, if you want to be perfect, go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. But when the young man heard this, he went away sad, 
for he had many possessions. So there's a few things happening there. First, the youth and the wealth are important in the story. When scripture here refers to the man as a young man, he's being referred to as what's called a neoniscus, which we have a pretty good idea refers in the ancient culture to a young person uh, between 21 to 28 years old. So this is a, a young adult, right? Likely left home um, and either inherited wealth or come into significant wealth. You could think of them as a, the Mark Zuckerberg of the day, right? This young adult who has significant wealth. And the wealth is such that I suggest part of why this uh, rich young man is here asking about eternal life is that most other parts of his life are taken care of, right? He's got his basic needs met. He's got his medium to long-term needs taken care of. His retirement's good to go. He's got a good house. He's got a good job. He's healthy. He's well. He's young. Life is good, right? So he's got time to think about what? About eternal life. And so the conversation goes about, well, you need to begin to be thinking about these commandments. Are you living rightly? Are you living in the way God is longing for you to live? Yes, I'm obeying the commands. He says, well, if you want to be perfect. This is another tricky point for us, right? If you want to be perfect, go and sell your possessions. You'll store up treasure for yourself in heaven. Come and follow me. And this is where today we, we struggle, we miss out on not being able to read Matthew's original words this morning because what he says there is if you long to be telios, if you long to be telios, and what he means there is not a perfection meaning a sinless life, but rather he says if you want to be telios, if you want to be mature, developed or whole. If you want to be whole, then sell your possessions, give them away, come follow me. Interesting, right? If we suggest that it's not just money or wealth is inherently bad here, then it can't be selling things just for the sake of selling them, right? No, there must be something else going on, and we see it immediately based on the young man's response. But when the young man heard this, he went away sad, for he had many possessions. Did he sell them? Seems to be most likely not, but we don't know that. What's happening here is that the way of Christ and the way of this young man's life are ultimately in conflict. And what's happening here is that the young man is forced to decide ultimately who is going to be in charge of his life. That what Jesus is saying to him is, I need you to empty yourself of your self-sufficiency. I need you to empty yourself of your capacity to control. I need you to empty yourself of the belief and the desire and perhaps even the means of securing a good life for yourself. And then I need you to place yourself in a life of dependence upon me. He doesn't simply say to the young man, go sell all your things and live a life of poverty. Just be miserable for a while and you'll achieve this perfection. No, what does he say? He says, I need you to give up this wealth, to give up your possessions, to give up these things which Jesus must have inherently known has a level of control on him. He says, I need you to let go in order to create space to come to me. 
because these are ultimately in conflict. And so, the challenge for us, the challenge that Matthew's gospel begins to offer us is to ask, what is in our possession? What is in our life that allows us to think we are in control? What is going on within us? What is going on around us? What do we have in our lives that gives us the illusion that we are God? Remember, right, we've talked about this before. If we go all the way back to the very beginning, Genesis 1, 2, and 3, we see that as sin enters the world, how does it happen? Adam and Eve, particularly Eve in the conversation with the serpent, it's about eating the apple. Why? So that she can see as God. That the introduction of sin into the world is based on the belief and on the desire for you and I to be God. And when that happens, what comes? It's the fall. It's the loss of the illusion. It's the pain of the reality that one, you and I can never be God and that you and I were never meant to be God. And so I would say this morning, church, that what's going on here in Jesus' brilliant perception of this young man's life, he's saying, not what must be done by you, Lord, but what must I do to achieve eternal life? What must I do? Because I can do anything, right? I can answer any question. I can spend any amount of money. I can wield any amount of power or influence. I can do anything. I just need to know what to do. Just give me the answer and I will do it. And Jesus says, no, no, my son. What you need, no money can buy. What you need, no amount of power can gain you. What you need, no amount of influence can bring about. You need not only to follow me, but you first have to make the space to remove the danger of this illusion that you are in control. And so the invitation for us this morning, church, is to consider what in our lives are we wrestling with? What in our lives do we need to consider giving away in order to create space for Christ to reign as Lord of our life. For you, perhaps, for some of us this morning, perhaps it is money. The role that it plays in our life. The illusion of control, of security, of safety that it brings. Perhaps for you, it's money. But I would say for a lot of us, it's going to be other things, right? Perhaps for you, it's the role that work plays in your life. Perhaps for you, it's the need to control what's happening in your kids' lives. Perhaps for you, what you need to give back, what you need to create space for, is by freeing yourself and how you spend your time. The question is, what do we need to give up? What do we need to give back in order to begin to make space for God to rule in our lives? And it can look a lot of different ways. Perhaps for you, as I said, it's changing your relationship to money, to your family, to your identity, your career. Or perhaps it's to your calendar. Maybe for you, and I know this is going to sound radical, and maybe just as painful as this young man selling all of his possessions, maybe for you, you need to get off Instagram. Maybe for you, you need to cancel Netflix. 
Maybe for you, you need to get rid of cable. Maybe for you, you need to quit doing travel ball. Maybe for you, you need to give up this portion of your life that tells you, well, I'm creating something. I'm doing something that's good. I'm building something. I am building this life. And you say, wait a minute. Is that who I really want building my life? That perhaps, just perhaps, we need to create enough space, enough margin for God to have room to show up and actually do something or say something in our lives. This morning, we said our third core value is the core value of simplicity. And I'd point out to you, it's intentionally, it's not the core value of poverty, but it is the core value of simplicity. Richard Foster, you probably have heard me mention him before. Richard Foster is um, towards the end of his career and end of his life now, but he is uh, someone we all owe a good deal of gratitude and a debt towards. He, uh, many years ago, wrote the book, The Celebration of Disciplines. He is one of the uh, forebearers, the forefathers of reclaiming and re-elevating uh, the practice of Christian spiritual disciplines in the modern age. It's a very small book. I would encourage you to read it. Um, another one, Streams in the Desert. It's about how do we recapture these spiritual practices in our life. Sold millions of copies about this book. But a while ago, I found that um, Richard Foster wrote a very small book on simplicity. And I wanted to share with you just a little bit about what he had to say, this thoughtful, bright man who, as it turns out, if you read the introduction to his book, he almost didn't write it. He was so resistant, so reluctant to writing a book about simplicity because he said of how dangerous it is. He says, simplicity is the most outward of all the spiritual disciplines and therefore the most susceptible to corruption. And the greatest corruption is to isolate it. Simplicity needs to be seen in the light of the whole. For example, there is an intrinsic relationship between simplicity and prayer, especially that central aspect of prayer, which is trust. That ultimately, if I could summarize the interaction, the encounter between Jesus and this rich young man, he's saying to the man, I need you to quit trusting yourself and to start trusting me. At the end of the day, that's all that the story boils down to. The conversation around the wealth, that was merely a prescription for this young man. He says, you've got to make room here that he knew you can't start trusting me until you quit trusting this wealth. But for us, we can substitute wealth for any number of things, right? You can't start trusting me until you quit trusting your capacity to solve any problem. You can't start trusting me until you stop trusting your capacity to outwork and outdo anybody else. You can't start trusting me until you stop trusting your capacity to give your kids the perfect life. And on and on and on. That ultimately, simplicity is a decision. It is a lifestyle that puts us in a position of trust. Because one of the greatest addictions our culture has today is an addiction to busyness. To a belief that if we just stay busy, if we just work hard enough, the problems will go away. Or... At least I won't have to think about them. But simplicity is an invitation to an embrace of the lordship, of the provision, of the protection of God. The question is, will we make the space? Will we give away 
whatever that addiction is, that temptation is, that thing that we are more willing to trust as Lord so that the true Lord may reign. So we as a church have decided that part of the way we're going to embrace brokenness and champion wholeness is through a cultural commitment, a congregational commitment to simplicity. Let me tell you, show you what that looks like. You'll see it on the screen behind me. That we value simplicity demonstrated by these things. Demonstrated by a shared striving to live lives that reflect our true priorities, beginning with Jesus. We value simplicity demonstrated by a commitment to excellence over busyness as a church. A commitment to deep rather than broad ministry. A commitment, rather, a culture of equipping and challenging one another to live, work, and love simply. You can leave those on the screen for a minute. That we believe as a culture, as a church, we have a unique opportunity. Because churches are full of people that bring their same challenges, their same worries, their same fears to bear in the life of the church as they have outside of the church. And so it is all too easy for us as a church, what? To chase the idol of busyness. That says, well, if we just offer more programs, if we just have more going on, if we just do, if we just do, if we just do, then somehow we'll be more effective. Somehow we'll justify our existence. Somehow we'll produce the church that we want to produce. Mike Breen is a, is a good thinker and teacher on discipleship, and I think he's right when he says, if you set out to build the church, you rarely make disciples. But if you set out to make disciples, you always get the church. And part of the life of a disciple is a life of simplicity. Now that doesn't mean life is easy, that it somehow doesn't take into account that we live in a complex world and a complex time. It's not an ignorance or an avoidance of complexity, but it is a countercultural commitment that says, I trust in the provision of the Lord so I don't have to trust in myself that I choose to simplify my life so that the goodness of God has room to show up. And so that we as a church have a capacity to stand apart in our community, in our region, in our nation, that says we choose to do hard things. We choose to do meaningful things. We choose to do transformative things, but we will not succumb to the idol of busyness, to the idol of apathy, to the idol of the unexamined life, but that we choose to do the hard work of pursuing a simple, beautiful, transformative life as a church. A shared striving to live lives together that reflect our true priorities. A commitment to excellence over busyness. A commitment to deep rather than broad ministry. A culture of equipping and challenging one another, of teaching one another, of learning together. How do we do this? This is tough. This is tough. So my challenge for you, church, is that you sit with Jesus. You sit with the young man in Matthew 19. The disciples after, Jesus has a great teaching moment with them as the story comes to a close. They says, well, who, who's going to, to inherit this? Who's going to have eternal life? Surely if anyone could do it, it would be this rich young man who has hit every mark of success that the disciples could imagine. Why are they so concerned about this rich young man? None of the disciples are rich. 
None of them can relate to this rich young man. It's because in their eyes and even in their ancient culture, this rich young man, they're saying to themselves, well, if he can't do it, then who can? He has everything. He's achieved everything. If he can't do it, who can? And he's, Jesus says, if it's up to y'all, nobody can. But thank goodness it's up to me. And because of that, everybody can. So my challenge to you, this church, this week, as we get ready to, to end our time in worship, is use this opportunity, use the rest of this morning of this service to ask God, to decide together with God, what is one thing this week that you can give up for seven days? What is one place, one way, one decision you could make that could simplify your life for seven days? Maybe it is deleting Instagram. Maybe it's watching one less football game. Maybe it's playing a few less rounds of Fortnite. Maybe for you, it's putting your phone away. I'll tell you one of the things that, as I've gone through this study, it's crazy. This may be the first time you've ever heard this, right, from a, a guy my age, but I'm becoming more convinced that one of the best things I can do for my relationship with the Lord and for my relationship with my family is go and buy a landline for my house. Because I can turn my phone off and put it away. How often am I finding myself killing time with my wife, with my boys, with my Lord by doing nothing that really matters? All because it's there. All because I can. My challenge to you this week, church, is that you pick that one thing. <coughs> Tell your spouse, tell a friend, tell a pastor. Choose one thing this week that you can simplify for seven days. If you're feeling bold, do it for 30 days. And take that step. Take that step towards picking a new Lord of your life. Let's stand together and sing. Uh, church, as you go this week, um, this is difficult stuff, right? Richard Foster says this is the most difficult, the most dangerous, but also that means the most powerful, the most transformative, the most fruitful. So much of the brokenness in our world comes from the warping, the taking of what is good and twisting it to what is bad. So much of the struggle for us in simplifying our lives is to take the things that are inherently good. Rest, relaxation, sports, time, technology, to take all of these things and to ask ourselves the hard questions as what is good turned into something that is bad. So as you go this week, may you go hearing these words from Jesus elsewhere in Matthew's Gospel, Matthew 6, where he says to his disciples, to his followers, don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. As you go this week, church, may you go with the courage to do the crazy thing, to make the hard decision to simplify your life so that the desires of your heart are where you truly want them to be. Go with joy, go with courage, go in peace. Amen. Amen.